Hi, Les from Retired and Living the Dream. Today's video is going to be about house rentals gone wrong. Yes, I, I've been a landlord and I dip my toes into the murky world of being a landlord and with all good intentions of providing decent accommodation for people. But sadly, everybody says that the rental market is easy, you can make a lot of money, and yes, you can. But also the other side of the rental market is when you get bad tenants. Now I've got two stories to tell you and they're both very interesting and I can laugh about them now but at the time it wasn't very funny. And basically how I got into property development, I built two of my own houses which give me a great understanding of, of property and maintenance and renovations. So I learnt an awful lot by building my own two houses. So I bought this house here. Now this was a sort of semi-derelict house in Redcar, not in one of the best roads in Redcar. I was going to renovate this house from an original three bedroomed terrace tower to six bed sits within this property and I give myself a year to be able to do it. Now I always believe in giving good standards and good accommodation for those who want it and this area was just going to be for social housing for those people that were on benefits and things like that. But these people that are on benefit still deserve a good place to live and that was my intentions to make it a really, really nice place to live. And the thought of being, make it a nice place or people don't want to leave because it's such a nice place and you should have happy tenants. Oh, that's what I thought. Anyway, it took almost a year to renovate this property and to get my tenants in. Now, because I was on the social housing list, there was numerous people applying for these bedsits. And you can imagine all brand new furniture, all brand new electrics, fire alarm system, fire doors, right up to modern day standards as to what the, the council wanted. Far better than any of the previous properties down that road because there'd been house, houses of multiple occupation for a number of years. So I came under the new regulations and everything had to be top class, which it was. So once I started getting my tenants in, and this is before the days that you collected a bond off, off people, off social housing. People on social housing don't have bonds. So anyway, I interviewed them all personally, and some of them were recommended by, well, three young lads were recommended by a friend of mine. One of them was his son. So I sort of trusted them, think, okay, I'll get them in, into it. And for the first few weeks, everything was running smoothly. I was getting the money from the social housing and I was, I was getting a good return on the investment that I put down to the house. And I thought, oh, this is great, you know. And the lads that I had in there, the three lads, they recommended three other lads, which was a big mistake. Because um, I just went off their recommendations. So I had six young lads in there and then things started to go wrong. Um, now the street itself wasn't a very nice street. There was drug dealing going on as there is in any social housing. You'll find that if you rent your house out to anybody that's on benefits, drugs are a big part of it. Anyway, because my house was sort of one of the best houses down the street, uh, showers, warm showers, everything was, was clean, everything was comfortable. All of these people that were in there were inviting other people because it was better, better for them to sleep in that house on the floor, uh, have parties in that house because it was such nice, everything worked properly, the kitchens were fully fitted, everything. So over and above the six people that were supposed to be living there, maybe there's another dozen people who were in and out and and then that, that's when the damage started to happen. Is I got a phone call at 12.30 on, a, on one night, saying this lad said, Les, Les, I've lost the key, I've lost the key. Can you come and let me in? And I said, I can't, because I've been drinking. I've had a bottle of wine. And I said, so no, stop at one of your friend's rooms and I'll let you in in the morning. One o'clock in the morning, gets another phone call. Les, Les, somebody's broken into my room. Duh. So I goes down in the morning. Sure enough, the front door's been kicked in, the, the locks are broken, his room's been kicked in, nobody else's room's been damaged except his. So he said, somebody's broken in, somebody's broken into the house. Did I believe him? No, I didn't. 
but now that's a damaged front door and a damaged door um, with somebody with no money or little money so I said to him give me a fiver a month to pay for the for the broken lock on his door because I couldn't guarantee that it was somebody else hadn't broken it and he said yes 20 quid so it took four months to get the 20 pounds off him so also I knew there was a quite a big drug dealer down that road and sadly he'd got three of my young lads involved in doing running around with the drugs and things like that and then once that thing started going along maybe it's about six months into it I decided to change the whole property from six bed sits to three self-contained flats and then I only had three tenants as opposed to six and three of them agreed to leave and off they went and the three lads that didn't want to leave with the three lads that had been recommended to me in the first place. Now they were happy because they were doing a little bit of drug running and they thought everything in the garden was rosy until I said to them, no, they have to get out. And then when I told them that they had to go because I was going to renovate the whole place again, they were a bit angry. So they called this, this guy who happened to be the big drug dealer down the road and he came <clears throat> and I'm not a man of violence at all I deplore violence and I don't think violence is the answer to anything and I've got to say I was scared when this guy came in and I knew he was the drug dealer but then I stood up to him and uh, scared he was 19 years old this drug dealer was 19 year old his name was Mally the Maladed that was his reputation, that he used to nut people when he was having an argument and he was a ferocious fighter. And anyway, he told me if I was to evict these three lads, then he'd blow me kneecaps off. This 19-year-old, hard as nails, drug dealer. Did I believe him? Yes, I did, because I knew his reputation. But I stood up to him and I said, listen, Mally, I said, I've got no chew with you. I said, you've obviously got a bit of chew with me, but I said, no matter what happens, I said, these three lads are going because I'm renovating it, I'm changing it into flats as opposed to bed sits. I said, you can do what you want. I said, but I've got much, much, much more money than you will ever have. And I said, if anything happens to me, I said, as from this afternoon when I go home, I said, I've got a number of people that also I call on. And if anything happens to me, you will never breathe for another day. So I said, if you want to get into one of these wars, and by the way, I was shaking all the time of doing this because I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to deal with this. It was a horrible situation to be in. So basically, we both stared each other out and off he went. Then these three lads refused to leave and then they stopped paying the rent. So I went through the, the court system to evict these lads. And I was told by the solicitor it was going to take up to 18 weeks to be able to evict these three lads so that was a huge expense to the solicitors to get rid of these people they were fiddling the electricity not paying me any rent for 18 weeks so now I've gone down from six tenants to three and they were always causing bother they were always inviting all their friends around and I got complaints from other neighbors about music being loud it was horrendous it was a nightmare for me and Oh, all the trouble that went along with it, with the, with the uh, potential drug dealer and I was having stress with that and my wife could see what was going on and uh, it wasn't a happy time. But anyway, seven weeks into it, the uh, next door neighbour had a go at me that the fact that these lads were causing chew and he said, I've got a method in which to get them out. And he said, I know you don't like violence, but he said, these people only deal and know about violence. And there's only certain people that can make this effective. So he called one of his friends and his friend called me and he said, I understand you've got a bit of a problem. And he said, I can come and sort your problem out for a couple of hundred quid. So not being a man of violence, never have been a man of violence. When you see your property being destroyed and not getting paid any rent, and I know it was wrong and I advised people not to go down this route, but I went down this route. 
and I employed his services to come and have a word with these three young men and explain the errors of their way. And that afternoon, these three individuals moved out. But whilst they were moving out, they ripped the fire alarm off the wall, they smashed all the sockets, smashed the windows, and off they went. Now, many people would say to me, well, why didn't I take them to court? It's going to cost me humongous lawyer bills to take them to court. I was just happy that they went. So what I did, I converted the place into three self-contained flats. There wasn't, within a year, there wasn't a single stick of furniture or a fridge freezer that wasn't bent, broken, bust, damaged or sold. And you can imagine where I got from the, the wife, yak, 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 in my ear with regard to this was a horrendous nightmare and I shouldn't have done it. And I've got to say, it's probably one of my biggest regrets of ever buying a property and renting it out to social housing or people on social housing. Now, thankfully, what I did, I converted into three self-contained flats. I got three elderly gentlemen in, all on social benefits, because it was a social benefit street. Nobody in their right mind would want to live down there because it wasn't a nice road also. But these three elderly guys liked it and the rooms were comfortable again. And I sold the property as a going concern with three residents in. And it took four or five months to sell it. But boy, was I happy when it went. I started to sleep at night. It was a nightmare. So these people about renting properties out, it's not as simple and it's not as easy as everybody says. You do and can have many, many problems. So the second story. The second story is a little bit more funny. It's not as serious as the first story, but I had a, a disagreement with the government. <laughs> and for those people trying to disagree with the government, who's going to win? The government are going to win. And did they win in this situation? Spoiler alert. Yes, they did. OK, well, I'll tell you the story. So just after I sold the, the nightmare of a house with social housing, I had enough money to be able to buy this house here, which was a, a street house in Middlesbrough. And Middlesbrough has a big university. So I bought this because there was a plentiful supply of student accommodation and more than enough students to fill the house also. So it was a three bedroom house and I had four students in there. And again, I, it was a normal three bedroomed a terrace house. Now I did it to the standard that the university wanted which was quite high anyway and I rented it out to the students for two years. A little bit of damage, a little bit of bits and pieces but nothing in comparison to what happened with the previous house. Then I was approached by an agency who were looking for houses to rent out to refugees and this lady asked me whether I'd turn my house over from the university to the to the immigration department who were going to rent it for five years. I just give it to them for five years and they give me it back in the same condition. So they said. And first of all they offered me only five hundred pounds a year more than what I was getting for student accommodation and the list of the things that they wanted was was just horrendous. It was stupid. So then they came up with a better offer and they said, we'll give you a thousand pounds more than what you're getting now with the student accommodation. We will look after the house for five years. So any maintenance, any repairs we will do over the five year period, then we'll give you the house back in the exact same condition that you give us it to. And then they give me the list of, of uh, alterations that they wanted. And these were absolutely far exceeding the standard what the universities were at. They were asking for fire doors in every single room with self-closing devices and uh, a smoke strip all the way around the doors, um, wired smoke detectors in every room and a heat detector in the kitchen. Now I had no problems with doing that because I thought at the end of the day it's way improving the property so when I get it back I'll be able to let it back out again to the student and it's a better house. And the thing that sort of ticked the box is that it was going to be five years of uh, no hassle because they were going to give me it. Anyway, I got the, the contracts from the, from the uh, agency 
I took it to my solicitor and the solicitor said, Les, you can't lose. He said, a fantastic. He said, five years, um, no maintenance. He said, and they'll give you it back in the same condition. He said, I'd go for it. So he sort of, okay, I'll go for it. So I did all the alterations anyway. And everything had to be new. New bedding, new beds, new furniture, new carpets, new sofa. Everything was brand spanking new. And it cost me quite a lot of money to be able to get it up to the standard that they want. And uh, I remember this day as if it was yesterday. And this guy comes, talk very, very posh and very, very polite in a pinstripe suit with his clipboard. And I was very happy with all the work that's been done on there. And I'm thinking, wow, th this is up to such a high standard, you know, he's got to take it, no problems. He, he'll, he won't find anything wrong with it. And he was there with his clipboard and he's going down and he said, Mr. Pearson, he said, we're not in a position to be able to rent this property off you yet because there are several things missing. So I quickly threw me, several things missing. I've got everything, I had your list, absolutely everything. And bearing in mind, these are refugees and immigrants that are coming to live in here. And I said, well, tell, tell me what's missing. He said, to be able to sign everything off, we require five pudding forks. Yeah, pudding forks. These were immigrants and refugees coming from Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, all of them places, but they wanted five pudding forks. <laughs> and they also wanted five face cloths. Five face cloths, five pudding forks. Well, I was out the house and back within 15 minutes with five pudding forks and five face cloths. And the guy said, okay, he said, it comes up to standard now and I can sign it off. Fantastic. Signed it off, never heard a thing for five years. And I'm thinking, oh, this is brilliant. Another 5,000 pounds extra than, than what I would have got from the university. Then I get a, a letter from the, the government saying I can take over the, the house now. So all excited thinking, okay, it's going to be left in the same condition that I give it to them, open the front door, what a mess. Absolute, just somebody's trashed it, I thought. You know, somebody's, been bro somebody's broken into it and trashed it. The sofa was ripped, the carpets were greasy, the carpets were mucky, every single bed was broken, or the mattress ripped. The kitchen, I don't know what they've been cooking with, but the oil was just everywhere. There was grease on the walls, grease on the ceilings. They'd been cutting with big knives on the worktop, so they'd scored all the top of the worktops. Everything wanted ripping out. It was horrendous. There wasn't a single piece of furniture there that didn't need to be replaced. So I went to my solicitor and I took some photographs to the same solicitor and said, Les, you know, it's a good deal. And I showed him the photographs and I showed him the contract that the house would be given back in the same condition and the solicitor said to me, Les, take it on the chin, government, big pocket, you're going to lose. So I was a little bit disappointed with the solicitor and I told him so, that I was disappointed with what he, he told me. And he said, I'll fight it for you, no problem. He said, and you probably will win. But what the government are going to say is fair wear and tear. And the government have got big pockets and he said, you'll never ever be able to afford to fight them. And he said, you'll lose because they've got more money than you will ever have. So he said, take it on the chin and move on. So that was my second story with regard to rental properties. So renting properties is not always a good thing to do. You can have many sleepless nights. Maybe I was unlucky because of what happened to me, but I've got plenty of other stories from other people that I know of a similar story, sim similar horror stories. And I know some guys who has rented the houses out for 20 years, the same tenants, two houses, same tenants, 20 years, and he's just sold the houses, and he never, ever had any bother. So, swings and roundabouts, good luck to those people who are renting the houses out and have no bother whatsoever, but I've got some more stories that I could tell you, horror stories from these rentals, but that might come down on another video. If you like the stories, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. Leave your comments down below. I'm um, interested in reading any of your horror stories also.
Thanks for watching. Till the next time. Bye for now.